Good John evening. Wendell. Glad to be here. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about the NDT part of this. And I think you've witnessed something that's very rare at ACI. You have three researchers that agree on something. <laughs> so here's my description of NDT. And I think you'll see the same things that have been said by others. NDT methods, in my opinion, examine specific characteristics or condition of concrete or reinforcement in a structure. They're conducted at a particular time, or they can be conducted periodically if you're trying to uh, determine the progression of some kind of deterioration. They typically focus on a particular region of a structure, and they are active methods in which we apply a stimulus and measure the response. Okay, committee 228 is non-destructive and in-place testing. And we have two committee reports. We decided at the beginning to separate uh, what was called NDT into these two broad categories, one for estimating in-place strength and the others that are not related to strength, other characteristics of concrete. So I will focus on the other methods in my presentation. If you have any questions related to the in-place strength, we will certainly entertain those. So the methodology for NDT methods, in my mind, can be represented by this series of uh, boxes here. We apply, apply a control stimulus, and in a few minutes, I'll show you the different types of stimuli. We measure uh, the response to that stimulus using some type of sensor. We capture that measurement by recording the output of the sensor. Then we apply some type of signal processing and the type of signal processing that is applied could be very different depending on the technique. From that, we can display the results in a, in a way that we can hopefully interpret the results and say something about the, the interior conditions. And the last thing we do is we verify what we've interpreted by doing some uh, invasive probing to check out that what we believe we've obtained by this indirect method is in fact representative of real uh, conditions. And that could be taking cores or drilling a hole, putting a bore scope in and seeing if the place that you thought had a crack or a void does in fact have a crack or a void. Now let's look at some of the common NDT methods and look at the stimulus and the factors that affect the response to that stimulus and then what, which methods use those combinations. So the stress pulse is probably the most widely used NDT and it started, Something's different between that and that, okay? So tapping and listening, that's one way of uh, doing a non-destructive evaluation. So we apply stress pulse. We can do that by mechanical impact or we could use transducers. What are the factors about the material, the concrete in this case, that affect the response to that stimulus? Well, for stress waves is the elastic constants, modulus of elasticity and Poisson's ratio, and the density. Now, those are very important to civil engineers and structural engineers because they have physical significance and can be related to the integrity of, of the concrete. Now, we can lump those two together in a property called acoustic impedance. And it's really the acoustic impedance mismatch whoops, that uh, uh, we use to be able to detect changes inside concrete. And the methods that are based on this type of stimulus would be the ultrasonic, ultrasonic pulse velocity, impact echo, impulse response, ultrasonic shear wave thermography, and dot, 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 because there's probably four or five other methods that are, are also based on stress waves. Then we have high energy electronic electromagnetic radiation. And the stimulus or the, the response to that stimulus is affected by the density of the material. And this is gamma and X radiography, 
rarely used, but sometimes this is the only way you can really see inside of concrete if you're looking for very fine detail. Then we have low energy radio frequency electromagnetic pulses. In this case, it's the dielectric constant of the material that affects the response. And air, by definition, has a dielectric constant of one. Concrete depends on moisture content it's between four and 10, water about 80, and metal has an infinite dielectric constant because it's a conductor. And we'll see the significance of that in a minute. And GPR, ground penetrating radar, uh, is the, the technique that utilizes this. Then we have low frequency electromagnetic fields. And the response is affected either by electrical conductivity or magnetic permeability. And cover meters are based on, on these. And there, there are two categories of cover meters, those that uh, uh, utilize what are called eddy currents and those that are, use uh, what's called magnetic reluctance. So they're one of them, the magnetic reluctance meters but only, will only work with ferromagnetic materials, whereas eddy current meters will work with any conductive material. And lastly, we have a thermal pulse, which the thermal conductivity affects the response. And this is infrared thermography. It, there was a time in the mid eighties when this, this and GPR were very uh, popular and kind of uh, the practicality of using infrared thermography uh, hasn't you know, worked out as well as some of these other methods, but it's still for certain techniques I mean, certain situations, it may be a very accurate way of finding defects that are near the surface. Okay, stress waves, we said there are many techniques and that make use of stress waves. And the important thing about stress waves is that they reflect where there's a change in this acoustic, acoustic impedance, which is the product of the wave speed and density and wave speed is affected by the modulus of elasticity. The acoustic impedance of air is practically zero. And so at an air interface, you get total reflection of a stress wave. And that's what makes stress waves a powerful way of looking into the concrete because it's very uh, sensitive to the presence of uh, air interfaces. So here we have the case on the left, a slab on ground. We tap it on the top and the stress pulse travels down. If there's a difference in the acoustic impedance between the concrete and subbase, we get some reflection, but it will be a weak reflection. The other case to the right, we have a crack, a delamination. We get total reflection at that interface, and it's very easy to detect the presence of that crack. Now, now not all stress wave methods are the same, obviously. And I'm going to show you two examples that are popular but they operate on different principles. That's the impact echo method in which we uh, get, gather information at a particular test point where the impact and the receiver are located. We get, gain information about the, the concrete below the test point. In impact echo, it's the P wave, the uh, compressional wave that uh, uh, affects the response. And in the, in the first uh, presentation, Tom had a, a slide or a little diagram to the right that had these semicircular things. Well, those were a P wave front and an S wave front, shear wave and the P wave. The P wave was the first one to, to travel out. It's the fastest of the types of waves. The principle of impact echo is that, that the pulse propagates between the surface and reflecting interface. So it goes back and forth and it sets up a resonant condition and the frequency is related to the depth. And it's related by that simple equation there. I should have put approximately because it's not exactly one. It's a number there that's about 0 0.95, 0 0.96. And John can tell you all about that if you need to know. Okay, so in impact echo, our sensor, you see is like a damp sine curve because it's responding to the arrival of that pulse as it bounces back and forth between the, um, 
the top surface and the reflector. And what we do is we transform that into what's called a frequency domain. And we have on the horizontal axis frequency and on the vertical axis is amplitude. And so we get this one peak that tells us the dominant frequency in the waveform, and that is related to the thickness of, of the element by that proximity equation. Now, ultrasonic shear wave tomography is, doesn't use a single uh, point source or a single receiver. It uses a series of sources and receivers, and they're all contained underneath that box, which we call the antenna. So there's a series of sensors that or a series of transducers that act both as receivers and transmitters. And in this particular device, it's the shear wave velocity that is measured or controls the response. And we measure the travel time between different pairs of these multiple transducers that are, that are in the antenna. And that travel time is used to reconstruct a 2D image of the reflecting interfaces below the antenna. So the output from um, ultrasonic shear wave tomography is a cross-sectional view below the antenna. So in this case, what we, we have is this classic uh, image that you, you find on the internet of a, a block with three holes and the bottom, the, the, the red at the bottom is the bottom side of the of the block. So you get a 2D image of what's underneath the antenna. And you could do this on a grid, go back and forth, and then put all those 2D images together. And then you have a 3D image that you can rotate, you can slice and get a lot of information about how the, the reflecting interfaces are distributed. Okay, so that's stress waves are good for finding air. Brown penetrating radar, uh, we get total reflection at metal targets. So before reinforcement, conduit, electric, electric cables, they, were, they will all reflect all of the electromagnetic pulse. This makes GPR uh, difficult or makes it difficult to detect air interfaces if you have a lot of steel because the signal from the, the, the steel or the aluminum or whatever metal target is in there so strong compared with the um, reflections from cracks or voids. What you can do with GPR, similar to what you can do with other techniques is you can do a scan on a grid, go back and forth many times, put all that information together and the software will create a 2D image of, in this case, the reinforcement. Now be careful when you interpret these images that the, the sizes of those bars are not really the size of the bars. The image tells you where the bars are located, but not their diameters. Now, they may have worked out some way of determining that, but I'm not aware that you can do that. And the last method I wanna talk about is impulse response, it was mentioned. Uh, the technique does involve an impact and a receiver. In this case, you see it's a bigger impactor than an impact echo, and also that the impactor has a load cell in it. So we measure the force and we measure the response. It's also, the testing is done on a grid. The grid is usually a half meter to two meters spacing. With this big hammer that is used, we excite the flexural modes of vibration. So we're not looking at for reflections between top and bottom surfaces. We're just looking at the flexural vibrations of the structure caused by the impact. Then we apply signal processing and compute what we call a frequency response function. It tells us the response as a function of frequency. And from these frequency re response functions, we can pick out a certain uh, index, if you will, and use, and then see how that index varies from test point to test point. And the common way up to now has been to simply create uh, contour plots of that 
index and then look for regions that are different from the other. So the impulse response is a great technique when you have a large area to scan and you'd like to find out where the hot spots are, where the potential defects are. So in this case, this is a, a scan of a, of a bridge and it shows you the locations where there is probably deterioration that you can then investigate further by using impact echo or ultrasonic uh, shear wave tomography or take cores. So in selecting an NDT method, some of the questions that you need to address is, what is the purpose of the testing? Am I looking for voids, cracks, general deterioration? Am I looking for corrosion? How large is my testing area? And which of the methods is best suited for the task at hand? And lastly, are the people that are gonna do this testing qualified to do this testing? You can't just go buy the equipment and become an expert in some of these methods. It, it requires knowing the physics and it's just the way it is. And now the great advances are being made with artificial intelligence and signal processing where it's, it's uh, you know, helping, but you still need to know what is going on uh, in these different methods. Thanks and I look forward to your question. Thanks so much to uh, Nick Carino.